What's going on guys? This is going to be our first of several different how to prepare uh, different wild game animals and techniques and stuff you don't normally use uh, when associated with wild game recipes. Uh, this was a hog that I killed on a friend's property back in January. Uh, it was a big 300 pound boar um, and we decided to make some hog cubans out of it. Really what the first video we did, we're just, we took the opportunity of, of having this pig. Uh, it was, you know, a lot bigger than what is normally even associated with eating as far as a wild pig goes. It's pretty wildly believed that you can't eat a pig that's that big. And we took the opportunity to, you know, use a little bit of um, advanced uh, preparation to to highlight that you can. Uh, it's it's the majority of, of the work that's being done is, is all beforehand. It's not necessarily even your cooking technique. It's just it's the way the meat's treated. Right, I had actually prepared this hog um, to kind of prep it and bleed it out right. I set it in the cooler for about 10 days and what I was doing is I have it 10 days on ice and each day I would drain out whatever water was in there and would replace it with more ice. Just kind of really bleed it out and get some of that funk out of it. Yeah, yeah, you're, uh, that, I mean, that's the, the, really the first step to, to the aging process. Most meat that you eat in the store or, or anywhere is, it's all aged. It's, it's, none of it's fresh. It's in it, whether it's, it's dry, hung, or if you're doing, like if you're icing it down, drawing the blood out, and then eventually doing what we did, was, which is a, a liquid brine, you're, um, you're accomplishing a lot of things at once. You're, you're drawing a lot of that funk flavor out, like he was saying, the blood, a lot of the, the nastiness lies in the blood. It's, it sits there and, and just starts to naturally kind of break itself down, even only if, if it's on ice for a couple of weeks. You're, uh, you're introducing flavor with the brine. You can use, we used a citrus variety, different spices, aromatics, stuff like that. All that is, it's just adding, you know, desired flavors in, into the meat and at the same time drawing out blood and you're, you have salt going on. There's a lot, a lot of different things going on, but really the intention is to, is to add flavor, add moisture, and, you know, minimize the, the funkiness that's associated with a, a, a pig that's that big. All right, well, we ain't going to discuss too much here. Uh, we go through it pretty in-depth throughout the video, so check it out. Give it a watch. Let us know what you think. Uh, also in the description, I'll include a link to the hunt. So check it out. Hope you enjoy. So what we're doing today is doing a couple cures on a couple parts of this big pig. And we're kind of going to show and prove that even big nasty hogs can take, you know, can make it taste good. Right now we're making a brine for the, the hindquarters of this big pig, the Chris shot. And really what we're doing is it's kind of preserving it, imparting a little bit of flavor and moisture, drawing some of the, the liquid out of the meat and kind of replacing it with salt and sugar. And uh, all these aromatics, we got a little bit of black peppercorn, coriander, star anise, time all this is going to add good flavor to this uh this ham this mixture is for the hind quarter meat that we have sectioned out we're going to brine that for probably four or five days in this mixture once it cools and we're cooking a, a pretty big mature florida boar and a lot of people don't think you can eat them and we're here to show that you can so we're going to take this hindquarter meat and go through it really thoroughly and uh, kind of clean off some of this excess fat, connective tissue, and silver skin. When this comes out of the brine, we want it to be ready to put into the, the oven, however we're going to cook it. The oranges we put in here are straight out of the backyard, and they, they added a, a really good aromatic quality. Uh, they're a lot stronger than we thought they were going to be. And it's the, the sugars combined with all the spices and everything really help... Um, help the flavor of this pig. We just pulled our hams. They've been in there for four or five days. And we're just gonna leave them out here on the countertop to come to room temp before we put them in the, in the oven to kind of get a more even cook on us. We got our hog roast out now. It was in the brine for five days. And we're gonna roast it in a low temp for probably about four or five hours. And we're not going to do a sear on it and brown it like you normally would if, there was, if this was a, at a higher temp. We're going to low and slow this thing. And we brined it for, for that amount of time because this, was, this came off a pretty big pig. And we're trying to introduce a lot of extra flavor and aromatics into the meat 
and draw out some of the you know excess blood and funky flavor that can be associated with a pig this big. So right now we're just going to season it, get it ready, prepped, and put it in the oven. So when you're seasoning these with salt or, or pepper, you know, you're not actually rubbing the meat. If you're just doing a, a quick direct seasoning, you want to give it a little bit of height so you evenly distribute your salt over it so you don't have clumps of, you know, a bite of really salty and then you miss other spots. You want to kind of just get about, you know, a foot and a half over it. We got a little bit of thyme that we just pulled out of the garden. This is, we're just going to lay this on top and it's, it's going to cook and just, you know, give it that much more flavor. A little bit of cracked pepper. And that's it. Going straight in the oven. So we're gonna we're gonna slow roast these for probably four or five hours, get it to an internal temp of about 155, which is a a little bit over what you necessarily need for pork, but we're just you know we're trying to cook it good. Um, low temp the whole way to to maintain that juice and all that good stuff that we worked so hard to get in the meat we don't want leaching out because it's too hot and it's a temperature of 250 right now we're going to check in probably about an hour and see where we're at what we have here is uh just ingredients laid out for our aioli for the sandwiches we're making cubans with a hogzilla here so we're infusing this oil here with garlic we're just going to throw this on the on the stove top till it, it heats up a little bit we're going to pull it from the heat and we'll just let the oils from the garlic just kind of naturally um, Get infused into the, the canola oil we have, but now we're just going to get this started on the stovetop. What we're doing with, with the garlic and the oil is we're bringing it up to a temperature to where it's it's cooking it through. This is pretty much what you want it to look like if you're infusing garlic into the oil. Once it gets it looks like this, you, and there's a lot of heat going on, there's a lot of activity. It's it's boiling over. You want to just pull it from the heat because if you leave it on there, it'll it'll overdo it and it's it's going to fry the outside and, and become bitter. But if we just pull it and leave it aside like that. It'll just get nice and soft and and really uh, just fl we're just looking to flavor the oil with this. We're going to throw the, the herbs and spices in that oil and let that steep with the garlic. And this oil is going to be what we're going to use for our, our aioli. We let this cool the, our, our oil and garlic cool off a little bit to a reasonable temperature. We got the, this thyme. We're going to throw the herbs in there and infuse that. We wanted to wait for the temp to drop on that a little bit so it's not going to burn it and, you know, just dry it out and fry it up. We just want this to, to kind of steep and soak at, at this temperature and we're just going to leave it in there for the rest of the time that it's uh, you know that it's going to sit. So let that sit and it's going to infuse it and just we're just building on the, the flavor. Now we're making the aioli. So we're, we're this is essentially mayonnaise that's all we're doing and the ingredients for mayonnaise are for this kind of emulsified sauce is oil of some kind and egg yolk. And once it binds together, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll show how you mix it together and uh, get it to form the emulsion. It's, it's permanent. It's, it's, we're chemically changing it to where it's, it's, it sticks together. And if, as long as your ratios are correct, it, it'll stay together as a sauce. So this is the oil that we infuse with garlic and thyme. And we're going to start by slowly adding this in to the egg yolk. At first, you just do a couple drops at a time just to get your your uh, emulsion formed. Once you start doing this, you don't want to really stop. You just, especially until you get a, a good uh, good sauce going, you'll you'll see the consistency start to change. It'll start turning a little bit lighter yellow, and then you know it's it's going to hold together for the most part. But the main trick to doing this is you don't want to add too much oil at, at once. You gotta just go really slow, a few drops at a time until it starts to to really form your your sauce. You can see now that we we've got that going and we've kind of taken our time getting the the uh, basic emulsion started. You can see the consistency; it's kind of changing. It's lightening up in color. It's uh, the yolk is binding with the oil. And after you get it set like this, you can kind of start adding it a little bit faster. You never want to pour this faster than you can keep up with, with the whisk. You want to be adding enough to where you can keep up with it and, and keep folding it into the sauce and, 
and combining it smoothly and evenly. And the consistency you make this is up to you. You know, if, depending on what you're using it for, you can make it like a really thick mayonnaise or you can make it a little bit thinner. Just depending, we're gonna make it pretty thick today just because it's gonna go on sandwiches. We wanna be able to spread this on the bread and have it just pretty much stay right where we put it. This can also be done in a food processor or a blender on a really low uh, setting. You know, if you don't wanna stand here and, and whisk this by hand, you can you can easily do it with the with the machine. You just have to be careful not to over overdo it. We're getting a good thick consistency with the sauce here. And, uh, you know, pre personal preference is everything with this kind of stuff, however thick you want it, if you want it thicker or thinner. But what one thing to keep in mind when you're making it is that you have to have some kind of acidic component, whether it's lemon juice, some kind of vinegar, something like that, to kind of cut the fat and oil and everything you have going on, because otherwise it just tastes like oil. You, you, you know, usually use lemon juice. Today we're actually going to use this infused uh, habanero vinegar as our acid component. So what you want to keep in mind when you're making this is you make it a little bit thicker than the eventual, you know, the final outcome that you're looking for because when you add the liquid in, it's going to thin it out considerably. So we're going to keep adding this oil, make it thicken up. The oil in a, in a mayonnaise or an aioli or most emulsified sauces, the oil is what is actually thickening it up. It's, it's not considered liquid. It's the more you add, the thicker it gets. And you want to be careful not to add too much per egg yolk. If you add too much, your, your sauce separates. It's as we call when, it, when we say it breaks that your sauce is separated because it was either overloaded with too much liquid or too much oil for the for the eggs to hold. Temperature plays a role in this too. You don't want it to be to be uh, to get too warm. That can that can separate. You, when you make this, especially considering you're using raw eggs, you pretty much want to refrigerate it as soon as possible. We just pulled our our ham here, and uh, we let it go to about a little bit over 150. It's going to carry over to 155. Some of the outsides got kind of dried up. We got like a nice crust going on. The the brine flavor on this came out really good. It's super citrusy, and it, it can't you know it infused it really good. It tastes great. We're just going to let this rest for a few minutes so it doesn't bleed out when we cut it open, and we're going to start making sandwiches here in a minute. All right, we got our ham pulled out of the oven, rested up, and now we're just we're slicing it super thin. We got some of it over here, just kind of holding it for our, our when we start building the sandwiches. But I'm gonna slice it super thin, just really good and thin, about as thin as you can get it with a with a meat slicing knife. And you always want to cut across the grain, never parallel. This was a a big hog, and a, a lot of people don't even consider these to be edible and it's just about your technique and how you treat the meat and you I mean there's a lot of things you can do with it you slow cook it we did this brine and this I mean this came out you'd be hard-pressed to tell that this you know this meat wasn't from a, a farm pig and it's a, a big old nasty swamp boar if you look at a cross-section of this the way you know you can see the the cure really set in soaked in it's got a really good sweet salty flavor from that, really citrusy. It's the the flavor took hold really good. This pork, wild pork, has a, a strong flavor on its own. And you want to use strong aromatic spices and citrus and stuff like that that can stand up to the that natural flavor of the meat. And this this worked out really well. It turned out great. Alright, we're getting the sandwiches ready for uh, to press. Putting some butter on the tops and the bottoms and pretty much all over them. We're just gonna press them between two cast irons. We got our pig, Swiss cheese, our handmade aioli that we just did, some pickles, mustard, we grill it, that's that's it, that's good to go. We just kind of lightly press it. We got these warm ahead of time, you know, pretty hot. And the weight will, as it cooks, kind of push the sandwich down and press it down. We press our sandwich for 10 minutes in between two cast irons. And we're just going to cut it and that's it. All 
Yeah, we just cooked it all the way through until it's good and melty with the sauce and pork's reheated. And that's it. That's how you make a, a Cuban sandwich out of a big, gnarly wild boar. All right, well, y'all seen how we got it prepared. Now it's time for the best part, the taste test. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Oh yeah. Pretty sure you can hard press for anybody to tell you that's not something you buy in a store. Except better. I would never guess it was a wild boar, that's for sure. Alright guys, well stay tuned. All summer long we'll be bringing y'all different recipes from wild game that we've shot throughout the course of this last fall. So stay tuned till we uh, bring you something delicious next time. Pen and stick them.